Well, Biocon reported a bit of a muted set in the quarter gone by, but what about the way forward? That's something that we'll discuss with Mr. Siddharth Mittal. He's, of course, the CEO and MD at uh, Biocon Limited joining us on the show right now. Siddharth, hi, good to be speaking with you. I just wanted to begin by discussing the margin profile because that seems to have, uh, you know, disappointed the street a bit, despite the R&D cost being lower. What led to the miss on the margins? And more importantly, do you expect a bit of a recovery as we head into the second half of the year? So absolutely, uh, I think, uh, you know, the margins did get impacted during the quarter. This was also the quarter where uh, we have seen a bit of a muted growth across all our businesses. Uh, we have faced certain headwinds and tailwinds. And uh, our core margin came in at 26% uh, during the quarter with R&D being 9% uh, of the revenues ex engine. And the EBITDA margins uh, were at 38%, uh, which, of course, included one-time impact of the sale of uh, our branded formulations India business uh, to Eris Life Sciences. Now, we are looking at various options. Uh, as you can imagine, there has been a pricing pressure on, on our businesses, especially on the generics business, which has impacted the margins. Uh, our biosimilar business had a margin of a uh, healthy EBITDA margin of 23%. And we definitely are taking necessary actions to see how we can uh, cut uh, <clears throat> some of the operating overheads and increase sales uh, so that the overall margins uh, grow over a period of time. Fair now, in terms of the second half, uh, what we have indicated that our first uh, half is going to be muted along the same, the second quarter will be along the same uh, line as first quarter. But there are many trigger events in the second half. Uh, we have few important launches coming up uh, in uh, both generics as well as biosimilars in the second half, which will drive the growth. And also research services business, uh, which has seen some uh, a re a reduction in uh, demand in the coming, in the last one or two quarters. We see a pickup as the biotech funding environment in the US improves. So we do definitely expect all the three businesses to pick up uh, the second half and the growth uh, to come back uh, at a healthy levels. Okay, so expecting a bit of a recovery in the second half of the year. Specifically speaking about generics right now, you talked about the launch which is lined up in UK as well. That is Lira glu uh, Glutide as well. Uh, the GLP-1 opportunity is huge as well. Talk to me about for the overall year, what kind of growth we should expect and this GLP-1 opportunity, how exactly could it scale up? Because that's become an important buzzword. But just wanted to get the specifics as well there. See, uh, the market is still to form for GLP-1. So right now it's early days, but let's look at it uh, from an overall opportunity perspective. I mean, if you depending on who, whose analyst uh, report you read, uh, the opportunity is anywhere between 100 billion to 150 billion, just coming from weight loss and diabetes uh, drugs. And the opportunity is growing. There are many, many drugs uh, which are at uh, advanced uh, clinical stage uh, for treating not only diabetes and weight loss, but many other uh, <clears throat> indications. And I think that Biocon is very well positioned as a vertically integrated company to capture, uh, to play in this uh, space. We have got the approval in UK, as we all know. We have also uh, filed in many other markets, including Europe, US, and uh, large emer emerging markets. And we expect those approvals to come in in uh, by end of this fiscal and also in the next fiscal. So this uh, would, of course, contribute uh, to our growth. Uh, I cannot give specific guidance in terms of how much it would contribute. But as I mentioned, second half of the year is going to be very strong. Compared to first half, we expect a good double-digit growth in H2 over H1 in the generics business. And I'm uh, Lira Glutide is going to be the most important contributor in that growth uh, Okay, so second half of the year is expected to show double-digit growth and, of course, big drivers there as well. I also wanted to discuss a couple of these biosimilar products with you because this quarter, of course, the earnings are down almost 12%. And I'm going through some analyst notes and they are talking about how insulin glargine has lost a bit of market share. Dalimumab hasn't really picked up the way you were expecting. When do you see a bit of recovery in some of these key drugs and key products of yours? See, uh, uh, while you did speak about uh, Adalimumab and uh, Semgli, I should also highlight uh, that Fulfilla and Ogivri, both biosimilar Trastuzumab and Pecfigrastim, have got to 20% market share in the US. We continue to gain market share in other parts of the world. 
However, simply, yes, uh, we've seen a bit of a dip and uh, we uh, definitely do not expect this to be permanent. We have been working with our customers to see what where we can get new accounts. Now, biosimilar adalimumab, uh, you're absolutely right, has been slow not only for us, but for the entire industry, as we all know that uh, the market share penetration for biosimilar in the U.S. has been slow. Uh, the innovator has uh, been successful in retaining a large market share, uh, and uh, we expect that the market is going to form in, during this calendar year, and in 2025 is when we uh, start uh, expect that we will start seeing uptick in the market share in the U.S. Now, that said, the product has done very well in Europe uh, today. In There are markets like Germany and France where we have a very good market share for Adelumimab. And overall, uh, in Europe, uh, Biocon has 6% market share uh, for uh, 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 Julio, which is our brand. Uh, so it continues to... Uh, you know, be a strong uh, franchise revenue contributor on an overall revenue base of a billion dollar. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, the market uh, will form well in the US in 24, and we will see an uptick in 25. Yeah, and you're also going to see an uptick perhaps on account of the new launches which are lined up. And I hope I'm pronouncing it right, but Denisumab and Aflibercept are lined up. Could you talk to us about the timeline of the launches and the kind of market size and market share you anticipate there? See, Aflibercept is uh, an $11 billion product uh, for the innovator. That's a product where we have got approval in Canada, Europe, and US, of course. Uh, and we do have a launch uh, next year in Canada. We, uh, we are under litigation with the innovator for the US launch. And uh, given the, uh, the matter is subjudiced, I cannot specifically talk about when we launch the drug in the US. But uh, of course, it's an important drug. For us, uh, it's a, a drug where we have a first interchangeable designation, and uh, you know that itself is a big advantage. Denusumab, uh, the clinical trial has uh, met the required endpoints, and we are on track for filing this uh, drug uh, with the regulator by uh, later part of this year. I also wanted a bit of a sense from you, Siddharth, as far as the debt situation is concerned. It's improved considerably from where we were. But what are the next steps, perhaps, to bring it down further? Are you planning some QIP? Are you planning some other sort of mechanism to kind of keep the debt in check? I think what we've indicated in the past, we, of course, want to bring down the debt levels. We had paid off $250 million at the uh, earlier and we do want to bring this down today. It's, the debt levels are roughly 1.2 billion. And uh, as we have said, that there are various options that we have that we are exploring to pay down this debt uh, uh, in the coming year.